Hi, I'm Alex Busetta, consultant at the Abacus team and also adjunct professor at McGill University. In this video, we'd like just to walk you through how a value stream map works and what does it give us. And uh, the tool that we're using uh, to demonstrate this is uh, what we call the Lean Six Sigma Companion, uh, which was developed by uh, Abacus uh, team. So this particular example here, instead of taking a traditional manufacturing example, we took a DNA analysis. So I might be working for ancestry DNA. I might be working for uh, police or uh, criminology lab. I'm receiving uh, samples, preparing my samples, going through a stabilization process doing some sequencing, so G1 and G2, so two steps of sequencing, um, an analysis, and then reporting. Obviously, this process was very simplified in order to demonstrate in seven steps how it works. So all my data over here is in hours for the demonstration, and each step, if I look at the receive inspect, I'm taking a picture, a snapshot in time. That's what we do when we do a value stream map. So I have only one request waiting. Um, I'm preparing the sample, I see that eight samples are waiting to be prepared and so on. So that triangle is the whip, the working process, or how much is waiting. Then the boxes, I've got um, CT for cycle time. So this takes me 12 hours to re receive, inspect, verify documentation, authenticity. Uh, set up time is something that you might not use all the time. It's kind of a, how much time are you needing at the beginning of a shift or beginning of the day? So as you are set up, it's not something that you would repeat for every single time yield. So my success rate, so in here, 95% uh, I'm good, 5% of the time I've got problems. And my batch is one, meaning I would uh, manage or receive and inspect only one at a time. In this example, everything has a batch of one, except for sequencing G2, where you see here, I'm putting all my samples in a machine, can press on a button, and 48 hours later, my 12 samples are done. What you have below is actually the key to a value stream map. It shows you the timeline. So first of all, the easy steps, uh, the easy part of the timeline, well, if uh, receiving takes me 12 minutes on my timeline, I believe it's 12 hours. On my timeline, it is 12 hours. Uh, if I look at my sequencing G1, 29 hours, and I've got here at 29 hours. And this time is what we call the cycle time. I compare it with my tact time. Tact time, which is the beat rate of the process. In other words, in average, I do get requests or I receive samples every how many hours? And this is telling me that according to my history, I know that in average, I'm receiving samples every 16 hours. So you see here, these are highlighted in red because they do exceed that 16 hours. I'm going to create some delays or bottlenecks. The other part of the timeline that you see here, for example, if I look at the example of the 116 is pure waiting time. And how do we calculate it? It is Little's law. And you see the equation here. So what I do, I look at four items that are waiting. And these items, each one of those is going to wait for 29 hours. So if you are not a human being for three seconds and you are a sample, you would be waiting in line besides three colleagues, so you're the fourth, fourth sample, how long are you going to wait? Four times 29, so or 116 hours. In this case, our batch size is one, so uh, we can all, only process one at a time. If you look at sequencing G2, it's a little bit different. So each sample is processed for uh, 40, 
eight hours, I've got tw 12 waiting. So 12 times 48 to calculate my waiting time, but there's a batch of 12. I can put 12 in my instrument, my machine, press on uh, the button and get the result at the end. <clears throat> so it's 12 times 12 divided by my batch size. Just like if you look at a comparison or analogy, uh, I've got uh, four pizzas to, to bake and I've got four ovens. I put my pizzas in the ovens and after 20 minutes, I've got four pizzas out. Same thing with my 12 samples here. So what you have completely at the end of the value stream map, first of all, you've got the lead time. Lead time is the most important thing. And the lead time is the sum of all the times in the process. So it is the sum of the 12 plus uh, 12 plus 360, et cetera. So if a new sample comes in, how many hours after is it going to be ready? And it's going to take 767 uh, hours, which is awfully long. And actually, if I divide uh, that number, let's say by eight hours a day, if we work eight hours per day, that's 95 days. That's quite, uh, quite long. The other aspect uh, that you see in that box here is the process time. And process time is solely the time that I'm spending doing something. So it is my uh, overall uh, uh, five hours, 14 hours, etc., without the waiting. S in some books, it's referred to as value added time. I don't really like that term because it's not really value added. Who's, who says it's value added? I might have a lot of wastes uh, that I would uh, see if I observed, for instance, the analysis. So that's the overall picture. And the efficiency is the ratio. How, what is the percentage of time that is process time divided by my total lead time? And in this case here, it's 21% which is okay. We typically say that processes that have an efficiency of more than 30% start to be good. Not, ex not excellent, but still good. And the value stream map is very key because it helps us understand where should we derive improvements first? Where are our worst bottlenecks? And in this particular tool, um, the bottlenecks are highlighted automatically, but you just need to be careful with something. Like you see here, uh, our tech time is 16. Uh, our 45 years much higher than the bottleneck, meaning we are going to create some clogging. We're going to have some waiting time, some queuing. Same thing over here, right? I've got uh, 29 hours versus my 16. The sequencing too, you need to be careful because Yes, it could be a bottleneck. And if, if I only had one, it would take indeed 48 hours. So that's why it's still highlighted as a bottleneck. But technically speaking, or I would say practically speaking, we have a batch of 12. So uh, you could argue that uh, every 48 hours you get 12 out, or if you wish, 48 divided by 12. Just like if my if I have batches, actually the batch is helping me. It means that very roughly every four hours, I can have a, it's the equivalent of getting something out every four hours. So it's not that bad. So I would look for my biggest one. And I see here seems to be the, or my uh, largest one, my longest one, if you prefer, 45 hours, and you see the heat. So what can we do? If we put on a, lab manager hat, could throw resources, could add some people, some stations to prepare their samples, and that would work, uh, or I could add some shifts. The first thing to do though, if we look more in, with the eyes of um, a continuous improvement professional, or prefer green belt, lean belt, uh, lean practitioner, is to really look at making an analysis and starting a project uh, or a workshop at this particular step. Understand what is happening within 45 hours. And I might find out that during 45 hours, I'm spending 10 hours reviewing what I should be doing with those samples. 
So driving improvement, really looking at the process, I might, for example, instead of having uh, 45 hours, uh, bring it down to 30 hours. And look here what's going to happen when I put 38, uh, 30 instead of 45, what is going to happen to my waiting time? Goes down. There's less waiting, so actually my lead time is reduced. Right, so ideally I would try to find enough improvements in here to bring it to tack time or lower than tack time. And in this case, another ripple effect that we will see is that uh, instead of eight waiting, you, we will see, and this is something that we'll need to observe, typically then we will see, for example, one waiting, either one or two, but absolutely not eight. Then I would go to my next opportunity, which would be the 29 and do the same type of uh, improvement projects uh, using uh, Lean tools, Lean Six Sigma tools. And let's see here that I am successfully reducing this to, let's say, 14 hours. So same impact, right? We have less waiting. Typically also we'll see less waiting because it's not a bottleneck anymore. We might see, let's say, for the example, two. And you see here my overall resulting lead time. Obviously here we discussed about uh, improvements in terms of time and I've got much more information on val that value stream in terms of yield, right? Uh, a yield of 88 is horrible. A yield of 97 or 98 is horrible as well when you think about it. It means that I've got uh, uh, 100 samples and, uh, and I miss my shot two times out of, uh, uh, out of 100. That's a lot, right? Imagine buying 100 cartons of milk or 100 cans of cones, uh, Coke, and having two cans of Coke or two cartons of milk that are spoiled or defective. No, that would not be acceptable in <laughs> any type of uh, grocery store. So this is, an, uh, in a nutshell, what uh, Value Stream Map does. I hope that you appreciated the, the presentation and the um, uh, demonstration. And if you'd like to have more information about it, you have the website. Uh, we also provide uh, courses at, uh, at McGill University. So uh, have a great uh, day and uh, thanks for uh, listening to that uh, uh, overall explanation.